I'm going to talk a little bit about myself really briefly. Um, I'm going to dive into some, some background, a bit of the history of distributed computing. Then I'm going to discuss the details um, to, to a limited degree of Hadoop on Mesos. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a case study of how we use Mesos, how we use Hadoop on Mesos at Airbnb. Um, some final thoughts and then questions at the end. Uh, so about me, I'm, uh, I'm a cyclist and a runner. I'm a uh, free software advocate and contributor. I, I created a little program called Conky that some of you may have heard of, maybe even used. Um, I work at a company called Airbnb that's a travel startup and it's, it's pretty cool, so you should check it out if you haven't already. Um, I've been computing for like super long time, computing as my mom would probably call it. Uh, and another thing you should know is, is I've been doing computer stuff for so long that I've, I've actually kind of gotten over it uh, at this point in my life. So I, I am really inherently lazy in my ways. So I, I've found new, more creative ways to do more with less or do less with more. Um, and that's, that's one of the ways that Mesos fits in here. Uh, so, some background. As, as computing problems get larger, we're, we're going to go like, like way back to you know, the early days. Um, and as computing problems started to grow, people wanted to um, do more data sets grew and quickly became apparent that um, you know, individual computers were not really adequate for uh, a lot of workloads. Um, we really need to scale beyond single computers. and there's a few different approaches to that. One approach is, you know, build a supercomputer, but that's, that's really complicated and expensive. Um, you could also build your own cluster, um, you know, like lease out a space, buy a bunch, whole, whole bunch of servers, and hire a team of people to manage it. Um, adding megahertz to your machine doesn't really scale. So um, that's not really practical. Most people can't build a data center or buy a supercomputer. Um, however, in uh, 2003, a project called uh, Zen, the Zen hypervisor was released. And this kind of paved the way for um, virtualization for everyone and large scale um, abstract data centers, I suppose. In 2006, Amazon beta their EC2 project, which is um, an implementation of the Zen hypervisor. That, by the way, is a screenshot, if you're interested, of NetBSD and three Linux distributions running on Zen. Very cool. Thanks, Wikipedia. Uh, so what happened also around this time? Um, 2004, Google published their MapReduce paper. This, this paper was really novel in one way, really, um, because it, it formalized the concept of map and reduce, which is really about taking a large problem and breaking it into two discrete steps that can be easily distributed and um, used. <laughs> uh, so another thing they did is rather than using expensive hardware and, um, you know, or buying supercomputers, is they, they built their data centers out of cheap commodity hardware. Uh, this allowed them to rely on robust software rather than expensive hardware to achieve high availability. Uh, furthermore, in 2005, the Hadoop project was created, and this is a free implementation of Google's MapReduce. So Hadoop has been very successful for two reasons, really. One is, well, maybe three reasons. One is it's free. Um, free is in uh, freedom. <laughs> and free as in doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and another is that it's, it's really robust and it's tolerant of system failures. So regardless of your hardware implementation, it'll, it'll get the job done. So we've got Hadoop and we've got EC2 or some other data center, but there's, there's still some glue missing. We have, we have applications that we want to run, like Hadoop or Jenkins, you name it. Um, and something like EC2 isn't really application aware. So, um, you know, some people have tried to, to solve this problem, like um, say Heroku, for example, 
they have a product that, that is great, but it's only good for people who want to do a very limited um, set of things. So, you know, supercomputers still aren't affordable, and building your own data center is also not feasible um, for most. So, how, how do we overcome these problems, and how do we find a middle ground between our hardware infrastructure, whether it's virtualized or not, and um, the application layer? I, of course, come to you guys with an answer tonight. The dream. <laughs> it's here. Um, so what's Mesos? You may have heard about it. It's, it's basically an operating system for your cluster. Um, Mesos is application level distributed computing. Mesos formalizes the concept of uh, resource management in your cluster. Mesos kind of is to, I guess, to data centers what MapReduce is to generalized distributed computing. Um, so why Mesos? It's a good question. Um, it's, it's not the only tool out there. Um, I, however, have my own reasons. Uh, for one, I, I really like doing things the hard way, uh, as you can see. But you know, there's, there's actually a real answer to this. So why Mesos is a formalized system for, for doing distributed computing. Um, and using Hadoop on Mesos means you get an extensive tool set like Hive and Pig, which a lot of people are already, already quite familiar with. Um, Hadoop is, is kind of like a gold standard for most people at this point. Uh, not just that, but there's no reason to stop at Hadoop. If you've got a Mesos cluster, you can use those resources to build your code base as well with Jenkins or you know, run Spark, Storm, Kronos, you name it. So what were our goals? Or I guess, what, what are my goals? I, let's be honest, I'm kind of selfish here. Um, forgetting Hadoop running on Mesos, I want to avoid complexity. Right? Hadoop as a system is really quite complicated. There's a lot of things, a lot of knobs. If anyone here has ever tried to set up a Hadoop cluster or like configure it, just it's it's not fun. So <laughs> Hadoop on, on Mesos should really behave like any other uh, Hadoop. For people that have used Hadoop before, if they're using Hadoop on Mesos, they shouldn't it shouldn't seem any different to them. If anything, hopefully it'll be a little better. Um, and also we want we want high resource utilization. We don't, we don't want wasted cycles. We want um, our hard spent money, I guess, <laughs> going to use. Um, so before I dive into a little more detail on uh, the Hadoop scheduler, I want to talk about some basic terminology. In the Hadoop world, um, the job tracker is like the uh, master of the MapReduce side. The job tracker manages the individual jobs and assigns job tasks to the task trackers. You submit jobs to the task or to the job tracker. Um, the task tracker manages the individual tasks that are assigned to them. Um, they also serve intermediate data amongst the other task trackers. Um, a task is just one unit of work for a job, and then a slot is a task executor on a task tracker. Uh, and then lastly, HDFS is kind of the other half of MapReduce, but I'm not really going to go into that. So what kind of challenges do we have? Um, availability is, is actually really quite tricky when it comes to Hadoop and you're spinning up and killing task trackers all the time. Being able to ensure that you have the right number of, of Map and Reduce slots available is kind of difficult. Also, capacity is a really tricky problem. And at this point, Mesos, um, I would say I could do better in helping with capacity. There's, there's certainly the right plumbing in place for um, you know, providing some tools for that, but it's not, not quite there yet. Um, so another problem that we have with Mesos, on, or Hadoop on Mesos, that we wouldn't have otherwise is, suppose, suppose you have um, a cluster and you're running more than one Hadoop you're running Storm, you're running Kronos. Uh, Hadoop generally will like to take up the entire cluster because it's, it's kind of greedy. Um, and the problem with that, of course, is that 
you end up with a starvation situation. Uh, Mesos, on the other hand, very, as of very recently, has a feature called reservations that allows you to specify per slave a uh, minimum number of resources to guarantee for a particular um, framework. So for example, you can say that uh, a storm will always get two CPUs on every slave. However, if storm isn't using those CPUs at the time, then Hadoop can use them. Um, Hadoop also has some really powerful tools like the fair scheduler, which um, has features like preemption and role-based fair sharing. So, um, like I said before, slot allocation is, is tricky business. Um, generally, we, we only want to use the resources we need, but we also want to use as much of what we have so that jobs, Hadoop jobs, finish quicker. Um, another challenge is that generally for the life of a Hadoop job, once the, once the slots have been allocated and a, and a task tracker is running, it can't be killed until the entire job finishes. Um, because it may need to serve map data to another task tracker. Oh, sorry, I didn't really cover this. <laughs> so uh, this is a kind of a contrived job flow, and you can see, you know, ideally you may want to allocate uh, this number of slots here, given that configuration. However, in, in the real world of Hadoop, you just have a fixed number of slots at all times. So the thought is maybe we can do a bit better than this. And I think we did. So the Mesa scheduler for Hadoop is just a thin layer that sits on top of the, um, the Hadoop scheduler. And what it does is it, is it allocates task trackers. It, it accepts resource offers and then starts task trackers and allocates slots to those task trackers based on what's in the job queue. Um, it, it can f use one of two policies, either a fixed policy, which is like similar to um, this, this table here, or it can use a, a variable policy which tries to be closer to the, the ideal allocation, but not, not necessarily. The, the task scheduling itself for individual tasks is left up to the underlying scheduler. So, for example, if you use the fair scheduler, which, which is a pretty good scheduler for Hadoop, then you still get all the features um, like preemption for your slots. So uh, just, just for the sake of completeness, completeness I've, I've included some sample of uh, configuration values we use. Some of these are, are new um, for Mesos on Hadoop, and some of them aren't. But uh, some important ones are like these minimum slot specifications, which allow you to provide a sort of guarantee of slot availability for your Hadoop cluster. So. Let's talk about how we use Hadoop um, and Mesos at Airbnb. Uh, the engineering and analytics departments are primary customers, and it's, it's used extensively for a number of different things. Um, some examples include like generating search indices or our pricing suge suggestion system. So you know we, we want hosts to get the best out of it, and we want guests to also. So we figure out, you know. Um, algorithmically what, what the best price is for them, and we tell them. Uh, we also use it for important things like fraud detection, which if you're renting your home out to your place or you're going to stay in someone's home, you want to know that they're probably not a bad actor. Uh, so what, what we had been doing before at Airbnb with Hadoop is we're using EMR, which is Amazon's uh, Hadoop as a service product. This this is not really, or at least for us, it wasn't great. Um, some of the reasons are that like, we were kind of locked into this, and we couldn't, it was, it was really tough to get away, I should say. And um, another thing that was kind of annoying for anyone who was using it is that it suffered from feature lag. Uh, so like, a lot of the newer features in Hive or Pig were not available to us. Uh, another thing that was really annoying is that it was actually a lot of work to make it work. Um, we had to do weird things like spin up an entire cluster and then destroy it again every week. In fact, we did it with two different clusters. And like, you know, what if, what if I put a file on one of those machines and I wanted it to be there next week? You're out of luck. 
so today we run Kronos, Hadoop, and Storm all on the same Mesos cluster. Uh, we finished our migration June of this year, so it's pretty recently. Uh, we have about 500 Kronos jobs that run um, and about 20, 20 terabytes of daily data, uh, somewhere in the order of one to two petabytes of archive data. Uh, our data availability is actually at an all-time high now. Um, everyone is, is really happy about it. Uh, you know, the, the things that people really like are jobs run faster, they finish sooner, things are easier to debug. Uh, the Mesos UI has some handy things where you can like go into the executor and view the logs, which is like a huge win, actually. Uh, it's also great that people get to use the newest Hive and Pig and tools like that. So rather than doing a demo, which I, I think if I came up here and tried to demo it, it would be the one time that it decided to fail. Uh, not just that, but like seeing a Hadoop demo is probably about as exciting as watching paint dry. Um, so, so anyway, I've, I've put up some action shots here instead. And you can see, um, you can see there's Hadoop. And it's, it's using up about 95% of the cluster. It, it likes to do that. It's a greedy. I think, is, is, no, pig. Sorry, I got the elephant and the pig messed up in my head. I think they should change the Hadoop logo to a pig, actually. Uh, you also see Kronos is running. It's ex executing some tasks. <laughs> uh, and there's some storm jobs going on there, too. Uh, and this, this is the Hadoop job tracker page, which you might have seen before. Uh, the Mesos Hadoop job tracker page looks exactly the same as the regular Hadoop job tracker page, and that's because it is. Uh, okay, so what, what else is there to, to do? Um, locality awareness is kind of a big deal in big data. So, you know, most of the time spent processing data is in slurping it up, reading it, writing it, serializing it, deserializing it. If you can cut down on transit time, that can be a big win in a lot of cases. Uh, HDFS on Mesos, that's, that's a project that's been talked about. Um, high availability job tracker, that kind of goes with the item after it. Uh, right now, we don't really have a high availability job tracker, which is a bit of a problem if you have critical jobs that run for hours and your job tracker might die. Um, however, Ben Heinemann, the uh, vice president of Apache Mesos, has proposed the concept of actually running the job tracker itself as a Mesos framework. Um, you could maybe spin up a job tracker per job, and then you know, once that job's finished, you destroy the job tracker, maybe. Uh, what else? Here are some links if, if you're interested. Uh, you can grab the code off our, the Airbnb GitHub page. Um, a lot of the patches are also merged in, but not all of them yet. They will be very soon. Uh, also, check out our engineering blog. We're hiring awesome engineers, so if you're an awesome engineer and you want a job, check it out. Uh, there's some other links in there, my contact details. If you send me an email, I, I might reply to it, but I can't promise anything. I'll do my best. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you all for listening, and thanks, for, thanks to Twitter for hosting. Uh, and, and thank you, Airbnb, for allowing me to work on this stuff, because you guys are crazy and really you shouldn't be letting me do this. I'm, you're wasting your money. So uh, that's all. Any, any questions? I, I actually knew this question. So the, the question is, why would someone want to choose uh, Mesos over Yarn? And like I was saying, I, I knew this question was coming. And I actually don't have an answer to that, because I don't really know what Yarn is. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's uh, an acronym. <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding, but uh, no, I, I'm really not familiar with the details of Yarn. I will, however, say that I, I think Yarn maybe is not fundamentally the best approach to trying to solve the problem that Mesos is trying to solve. Well, <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Keep it down back there. Talk up here. Okay, uh, is that is that an ad adequate answer? <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay. Do, do you have another question? <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, so uh, the question is, how do isolation containers work in the context of Hadoop? Um, I would say they work exactly the same in, in any other context. That's the simple answer. But um, I think they're particularly good for Hadoop because Hadoop, um, especially if you have people using your cluster that are writing like Hive jobs or are um, maybe even trying to write jobs. <laughs> oh, I'm laughing because why would you let anyone do that? But <laughs> suppose someone is writing their own MapReduce job. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and they're submitting it to the cluster. Uh, you, you don't want that running away. That, that would be a bad day for anyone who has to get real work done. So. Um, you know, I think the, the resource I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I think the resource isolation is, is great. And um, we, we actually use the CFS resource isolation um, in production. And we also use um, another thing, which is CFQ. Is that right? Uh, which is a, a fair sharing I.O. scheduler um, for, uh, or it's a, like a C group module. Is that OK? Any other questions? All right, I answered them all. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>